now let's uh, let's establish some parameters now um i will assume you've either died or gone to sleep if you're quiet <laughs> so either one works for me it doesn't you need some rest that's fine uh but if you've um if you've passed away please tell your neighbor <laughs> It is a joy to be here in um, uh, in the uh, Pittsburgh metropolis. Some of my dearest friends in the world uh, are in this metropolis, and um, because I love them so much, I will not name them, uh, so they don't have to get embarrassed. But uh, it is a joy to be here. Um, I am a, a southerner by God's grace, uh, and so when I see the white flakes of death falling from the sky. I automatically assume I'm a stranger in a strange land. Someone asked me uh, one time, um, how did you do in Boston, Massachusetts? And I said, I got there and I left as quick as I could. <laughs> Wonderful time. I love being in Boston and I love make, I've, I've made lifelong friends there in Boston. But it snows in Boston. And the only time I like snow is on television. That's why I like snow. I think television is a perfect place for snow. <laughs> As Father told you, I am a former police officer uh, and for many years in my 20s. And, and then I was a Protestant pastor uh, in, in the um, evangelical Protestant world, mainly uh, basically a Pentecostal pastor uh, in Woodstock, Georgia, another suburb of Atlanta for many years. And while I was doing that work, I also was involved in Christian media and radio and television. And uh, me and my best friend made the serious error of reading church history. That began a journey that took about 10 years for us to enter the Orthodox Church. But when we did enter the church, uh, I was pastoring, a, a, like I say, a, a fast-growing church in the metro Atlanta area. And by the time we... Um, we're ready to enter the Orthodox Church. Um, we had about 20 families. We all converted together in uh, November of 2001. Uh, after that, uh, when I when I was uh, when I was con when I converted to the faith, my spiritual father told me, he "Said now Barnabas, that's what he named me. My mother still calls me Chucky, and uh, uh, no, you can't call me Chucky." Uh, but uh, my spiritual father told me, he "Said now listen, Barnabas, you're going to get married." I said, "Okay." Uh, I wasn't married when we converted to faith, and so uh, you're going to get married, he said, but uh, what, I want you to know I'm not going to allow you to marry another convert. You have to marry a lady that grew up in the church her whole life. And he was a convert himself, and so I said, you know, Father, of course I'll obey you. You're, you're my spiritual father. I understand obedience. And so uh, he, um, I said, but will you tell me why? He said, yeah, sure, no problem. He said... The lady you marry will know in her bones what you just know with your head. And you'll be able to explain to her why she does what she does. And there's the kicker, folks. And this is where we're going to launch from this morning. He told me this, looked at me right in the face and said words that still ring in my heart to this day. He looked at me and said, these two worlds will not survive apart. They need each other. And there are lots of reasons for that, but we'll talk about that uh, as we as we go along. But I want to read you a passage of scripture as we get started. And do you mind if I erase what's on the board? Can I can I use this? Yeah. I hate to, I mean, somebody did a good job writing here. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about the parish as steward this morning. And uh, by the way, George, what kind of time do you have? As much as oh Lord have yeah, mercy, don't tell me that. I mean, goodness <laughs> gracious, you got to give listen. My sound twelve thirty. The sound of my voice comforts. So, I, <laughs> so we're going to talk about the parish as steward, and we've heard the word stewardship a great deal uh, in the last several years among us Orthodox. Uh, but I want to talk about the parish as steward in a particular way. And I want to read this passage of scripture to you, and I want you to draw out one of the main things that the Apostle Paul tells his young new priest, Timothy, he's assigned it to a parish, and Tim, he's telling Timothy, 
what is the most important thing for him to do as a priest? Listen to what he says. It's 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 15. These things I write to you, Paul writes to Timothy, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. And then I want to focus on that phrase that the church is the pillar and ground of truth. So if our Orthodox Church is the pillar and ground of truth, what does that truth now insist that I do when I understand being involved in church life? I will make the bold statement to you of what Father George was saying is exactly right. That the metropolis of Pittsburgh is responsible for millions of people within her borders. Now, let's take that big number and, and shrink it down to something that you can use. I'll tell you a story. I'm a Southerner, so telling stories is what we do best. When I was uh, when I came to Cumming, Georgia, uh, was I became friends with the, uh, the, the 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 county commissioners and one the, the head of the county commission. Was talking with me, he said, you know, Father Barnes, we're so grateful that you're here. I said, well, I said, well, brother, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the Orthodox priest here in the county, and so, um, so it's my responsibility to take care of the county. That's that's my that's my job. You, I'm, I'm called Father. Father's not a title. Father's the confession of a theological truth. When we call our priests Father, we are confessing a reality. And so I told this man, I said, well, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the Greek Orthodox priest here in the county. And so I'm, I'm the father, I'm, I'm father here. So that's my job. He said, well, he said, but, but Father Barnabas, you're not all Orthodox. I said, well, Lord, man, I just got here. Give me some time. <laughs> <laughs> but I am responsible for it because father is not a title. Now, if that's true of your parish priest, you are also, as a parish in a local area, responsible for the people that surround your parish community. I'll give you a quick example. Uh, my, my one of the families in our parish had a uh, had a uh, house blessing, and they invited their neighbors. Hint, hit, nudge, nudge. Pay attention. They invited their neighbors to participate in the um, uh, in in the uh, uh, the the, uh, the house blessing. This precious lady, it's a Hispanic lady. And uh, after the service, she was very, very moved by it. She really thought it was beautiful. And she looked at me, she said, Father, do you think I could possibly attend the church service? Well, of course, dear, of course you're welcome. She said, well, it says Greek Orthodox. I'm wondering, is that, you know, is it just for the Greeks? I said, well, I sincerely hope not, dear. I'm not Greek. You may let me be Greeks. <laughs> But it's interesting to me, dear ones, that she would have that question that she would ask. And what is our responsibility if we are really the pillar and ground of truth that the Apostle Paul says the church is? What is our responsibility to our people in our neighborhood? What are we called to do and be in the church of Jesus Christ here in the Greek Orthodox metropolis of Pittsburgh? Where are you called? And what are you called to become? So we're going to talk about the parish as steward, and we're going to decide that the idea is we're going to shift from an inward-focused community to an outward-focused community. Now, dear ones, uh, you got to understand something. I have every intention of making you angry. That's my goal. I, and, and so when you feel anger or you feel unsure, know beyond any shadow of a doubt, Father Barnabas is doing this on purpose. An old preacher one time told me, he said, son, your job is to comfort the afflict, afflicted and afflict the comfortable. <laughs> yeah. It's a job. So one might want to cinch up one's girding their loins and be ready.
because I have every intention of challenging preconceived notions and ideas that are not just antithetical to being orthodox, but are actually poison that are killing our communities. And if you're interested in being more than just a caretaker until you are able to put your parish in a funeral home, then it's time to wake up and pay attention to some very significant realities. We all heard the stories of the, de the demographic reality of our church here in the United States. In the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese, the last reports are the number one kinds of services that we're having in our parishes are funerals. Marriages have gone down. Chrismations have gone down. Now, I'm doing my best to, to, to uh, mess up that curve. This year at Fosca, we'll be making 42 people Orthodox. We average anywhere between 20 to 30 a year. This year has been a good year because of the pandemic. Believe it or not, we've had more people interested in becoming Orthodox than ever before because they were exposed to the church through the Internet when they weren't going to their parishes, they weren't going to their churches. They explored and found our, our parish and found the stuff on the, online. And the outward focused reality of our community drew them into the church. So I want you to listen to what St. John Chrysostom says that I think is probably one of the most significant things that I have ever read from St. John Chrysostom. If I can get this thing to work. St. John Chrysostom declares, there is nothing colder, listen to me, there is nothing colder than a Christian who is not concerned about the salvation of others. Do not say, I cannot help others. For if you are truly a Christian, it is impossible not to. If you are truly a Christian, it is impossible not to help others. It's impossible. Natural objects have properties that cannot be denied. The same is true of what I've just said. Because it is the nature of a Christian to act in that way. Do not offend God by deception. If you said that the sun cannot shine, you would be committing an offense against God and making a liar of him. It is easier for the sinner to shine or to give warmth than for a Christian to cease to give light. It is easier for that to happen than for light to become darkness. Do not say that that is impossible. What is impossible is the contrary. If we behave in the correct way, everything else will follow as a natural consequence. Remember that phrase. A natural consequence. The light of Christians cannot be hidden. A lamp shining so brightly cannot be hidden. Now, what strikes me as very powerful about what St. John declares is that he says there is nothing colder than a Christian who is unconcerned of the salvation of others. I did a retreat for a parish in the Northeast. I won't say where, just in case you might know these people. And they wanted to uh, revitalize their community. Community was a typical Greek Orthodox community built in uh, uh, several decades ago when a lot of immigration came in and uh, the people were working in the factories and it was obviously a blue collar town. And it, it, you know, the story is very ubiquitous. It's, it's all over the place. The demographics changed. Everybody's going out to move out to the suburbs, doing, doing all kinds of stuff. But these folks wanted to save their community here in this town. And so they asked me, what do we need to do to save our community? I said, well, I think what? I would be able to tell whether you really are wanting to save your community if by the answer you give to this next question. Are you ready? They said, okay. Why don't the people who live across the street come to church here? Dead silence. Kind of like you guys. <clears throat> I use the phrase dead silence on purpose. But. <laughs> Why don't the people who live across the street come to church here? Now, there may be wonderful reasons. Maybe they're not interested in church. Maybe I had one lady say, well, but father, they're, they're not Greek. 
So, neither am I. I did marry a Greek girl, though, so that does give me some points, right? <laughs> and my precious mother-in-law won me over with the spotty book with the fresh bottle of it. <laughs> They're not Greek. Well, okay, so what's the purpose of your parish here? Is this the Yaya Baklava Recipe Preservation Society? <laughs> or is this the pillar and ground of truth? Not the Greek pillar and ground of truth. Not the pillar and ground of Greek truth. The pillar and ground of truth. Oh, Father, I know what you're going to do. You're going to blame us Greeks. Well, I mean, that's an easy target. I'm not going to do that. That's horrible. <laughs> But you have to ask the question, brothers and sisters, what is the purpose of the church? What is the purpose specifically of your parish where you are? If it's just to maintain the status quo, that's fine. But please understand the demographics are telling us that our kids are checking out and our grandkids are disconnected. One report said that over 80% of Americans of Greek ancestry are no longer meaningfully connected to the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of the United States. Why? <clears throat> We're still doing basketball tournaments. Well, we are. Glory to God. We're still doing, uh, we're doing, I so we just finished the Hellenic Dance Festival in Atlanta. My daughter was one of the best, in fact, she was the best dancer there. She was. We're still doing those same things, and yet, what did somebody say? The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting a different result. The demographics are, at, are demanding that we deal with reality. And if we're going to deal re with reality, we have to work to see our communities become outward focused communities simply to fulfill what we are called to be in the first place. You are the church of Jesus Christ. Period. Full stop. End of discussion. You know what we've discovered? People want to be Orthodox. They really do. People want to be Orthodox. People around your parish want to be Orthodox. Uh, fathers, let me ask you a question. If I could tell you that within six months you could have 20 new families in your parish and they all tithe, are you interested? Because that's what's at stake. I promise you, five miles outside the front door of every one of the parishes in this room are at least 20 families who want to be Orthodox. And if they only knew they could, they Right now, Father, that's hard to believe. Well, it is hard to believe because of the mindset. So what we're going to do this morning, and I can only maintain this pace so uh, so much, so uh, keep, me, keep me in your prayers. We're going to talk about three specific ways that we're going to make our parish a good steward of being the pillar and ground of truth. How to change our parish from an inward focus to an outward focus. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, and I'll make this provocative statement, one, one of many, I promise you. I'll make this provocative statement on purpose. If you see your parish change from an inward focus to an outward focus... It will make your folks that are already there more committed to orthodoxy than they've ever been before. The miracle of being an outward focused parish is that the folks that are already there get more energized to stay connected to the orthodox faith. And I don't know about you guys, but we all want our parishes to survive, don't we? We all want our parishes to survive. We all want our parishes to be passed on to the next generation, don't we? I mean it. Now, that's just, that, be, I'll warn you now. Amen is like sitting to a dog for me. Now be careful. I'll allow them to break out the homily for a second. So the first thing we're going to do. Uh, you can hear me. The first thing we're going to do to change our parishes from an inward focus to outward focus is we're going to change the mindset. of the community. We're going to change the mindset of the community. 
Brothers and sisters, this is the indisputable most difficult part, especially communities. And by the way, how many of you are, are uh, involved in communities that are uh, 100 years or old, more older? How many of you? Holy moly. <laughs> more than half the metropolis. More than half the metropolis is 100 years or older. Now, that means you've got 100 years of practices that have been ingrained and people, by the way, do you know what the seven last words of a dying church are? We've never done it that way before. <laughs> and so you have, now, 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 fathers, I want you to know I have a, I have a particular sweet, sweet spot in my heart for all of you. That's, that's the hardest part of the job changing the mindset of a long-term community. But here's the thing that should motivate you. If you don't do it, the community is going to die. In fact, let's all be honest, they already are. In very significant ways. Um, uh, we are very blessed in, in, uh, in, in uh, coming. Uh, it was a mission parish when I got there. I'm the longest serving pastor that they've ever had there. I've been there almost 14 years. And, uh, and but we're 75% convert in the community. And that actually is, we're actually 100% convert because even my life monks have really been turned on by the faith. Which by the way, just to give you a little inside information, I would take, I would, I'll give you 10 converts for one lifelong Orthodox turned on by their faith. I get that happen and I've saved myself decades of problems. Well, let's face it, folks, converts are a pain. But the reality is because you've got there's so much to unlearn. When I became a, when I became an Orthodox Christian, my dad was broken hearted. He said, son, you were going to be bigger than Joel Osteen. I said, well, I'm putting on a little weight, but I'm trying to. <laughs> I don't think he meant that. But, uh, but he said, son, you were going to be big. You were going to you were already doing the media stuff and you were going to be on your dynamic. And blah, blah, blah. I said, yeah, dad. But God saved me from that. He gave me the fullness of the faith instead. And I told him this. I used this illustration. It helped him a great deal. Dad, I needed a fireplace for my fire. Because without the fireplace of the pillar and ground of truth, the fire of zeal becomes destructive. But with the wisdom of the fathers of the church and the wonderful structure of the fullness of the faith that is Orthodox Christianity. You know, Orthodox Christianity is the fullness of the Christian faith. You know what happens in every culture that an Orthodox church goes to as a missionary movement? Without exception, well, with the exception of, of Japan, but I'm still holding up hope. Every culture that has Orthodoxy come as a missionary movement, that Orthodoxy becomes the, the predominant expression of Christianity in that culture. One. Because Orthodox Christianity is the fullness of the Christian faith. Now, if you don't believe that, I get why this is the rest of this stuff is boring. If you think this is just a, a, a you know the, the happy accident of your birth and and, um, and it's just this is just you know a, a, a cultural decoration to your American way of life, okay, that's fine. This is the rest of this stuff is going to be boring to you and it's not going to mean anything to you. I get that. I really do. But understand that mindset is killing the faith of our kids and our grandkids. And it has to change. So in our community, the first thing we did is we changed the reason for the festival. How many of you have church festivals here? You have church festivals? Oh. How many of you depend on church festival monies to pay your bills? How honorable is it for a community not to be able to pay their own bills and depend on strangers? I'm just asking the question, children. So the first thing we did, we changed the reason we did a festival. To begin changing the mindset, especially of a long-term community, you must begin with the money. Because what you spend your money on and how you raise your money are icons and indications of where your head and your heart are. You give me a man's checkbook and I'll tell you what he believes. 
just what is. So the first step in changing the mindset of a parish from an from an inward focus, let's just survive, let's keep the, the, the status quo, to an outward focus where we're actually interested in becoming the pillar and ground of truth for our local community is to change the mindset around the money. And yet I guess you guys are gonna spend a little time talking about money today, aren't you? Pay attention to what to how you how the metropolis sets their priorities. Watch what you spend your money on. Now, I'm not saying that's good or bad. It's a diagnostic tool for you to look into the heart of your organization. It is neither good nor bad, and it's not about, oh, we're doing it wrong. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying use the moment in a sober and a, and a, and a, a, a disconnected way to diagnose the health of your organization. So the first thing we did is we changed the reason of the festival for fun, from fundraising to outreach. The reason we do a festival is to reach out to people in our community and share our faith. So because of that, the number one event at all of our festivals is the church tour. And the church tour is designed specifically to get them to convert. You mean you do this on purpose, Father? As a matter of fact, we're the pillar and ground of truth. This is the fullness of the Christian faith. A human becomes who he's really created to be in the, under the influence of the glorious mystery of the wisdom of the Orthodox Church. You and I become who we, we were created to be because of the fullness of Orthodox Christianity. Orthodox Christianity is the truth. Because she points us to him who is the truth. The way Orthodox worship, the way Orthodox pray, the theology behind the Orthodox church, the divine liturgy of the Orthodox church is all designed to get you used to eternity. And guess what, gang? You need to learn how to get used to eternity because every person I'm looking at right now are going to live forever. <laughs> every one of you. One of the fathers said, God has cursed the human race with eternal life. Uh, but anybody ever been to Pascha? You ever attend a Pascha service? Yeah. You ever? How many of you have been to a Pascha service? You ever been to a Pascha? Good. I, I go regular uh, every year. I mean, they're not going to start it out. <laughs> but it's interesting. What's the central message of Pascha service? See there, the white boy can do Greek. <laughs> hey, listen, I spent over 70 grand learning that stuff at seminary. And I, when I was an old man, I didn't go to seminary until I was 41. Karitzas can tell you. Uh, Father Jim, uh, Father Demetrius, better be, be careful here. He's, he's one of my best friends from seminary. So this is his fault mainly. But uh, no, <clears throat> Christ is risen from the dead. You see, if you were to act, let's all pretend just a second that we all actually believe that orthodoxy is true. Let's just pretend. And that orthodoxy is actually the truth for every human. Let's pretend. And, G, and the central message of the Orthodox Church is that Jesus Christ has conquered mortality so that now mortality becomes at best a minor inconvenience. We were just praying the memorials for these precious, uh, high, the, our precious hierarch and our precious brother priests, knowing full well that that's not the end of their story. Because Christ is risen from the dead. And if Christ is risen from the dead, my angels, you're going to live forever. And all of your neighbors are going to live forever. And all of your family members are going to live forever, even your mother in law. <laughs> Doesn't seem fair, but I'm going to leave that alone. I'm not going to bother. You're going to live forever. The Orthodox faith is designed to teach you how to call that eternity heaven. And if you don't know how to do what the Orthodox faith teaches you, and that goes for you, for your neighbors, for your relatives, and even your mother-in-law. 
you are, there's a very good chance you're going to call where you are hell. How in heaven's name am I going to stand before the awesome judgment seat of Christ and give a reason why I allowed the neighbors of my parish not to know this treasure? What's going to be my excuse? Well, Lord, they weren't Greek. And Lord Jesus will look at you and say, neither am I. My father-in-law, God bless his memory, uh, uh, um, his name is uh, Timotheos. Timotheos is the very Greek man. And he looked at me when I was dating his daughter, and he was very, very proud that his daughter was marrying a man who was probably going to be a priest. And so after I went to seminary, Tim called me up one time and he said, uh, Varnava, how many of the disciples were Greek? I said, Baba, none of them. None of them were. None of them? No, none of them were Greek. I said, Baba, it's even worse than that. Christuli and Panagia. Not Greek. And he was quiet on the phone, and you could almost feel that, that he was just shocked. And then he came out with the perfect answer, perfect answer. When he heard that I tell that Christuli and, and Panagia weren't Greek, and he said on the phone, but not anymore. <laughs> perfect. Second grade or what? You can use that and pretend you made it up. That's fine. <laughs> All of us pray every divine liturgy that we will have the right answer before the awesome judgment seat of Christ. How you spend your money in your parish is a diagnostic tool for you to know the heart of whether your parish is an inward focused parish or an outward focused parish. The first step that we did to change the mindset of our community was we changed the purpose of the festival. So we made the festival an outreach event. And the way we did that was we trained all of our people to welcome our guests. We don't have any visitors at Saints Raphael, Nicholas, and Irene. They're all guests because guests can become regular home folks. Visitors are just passing through. We don't have any visitors. We always have guests. Uh, language matters, folks, and I'm not just talking about what we do to the divine liturgy. How you say something is your mindset. Changing the mindset means changing the way you talk. Change the way you think, you'll change the way you speak, and then you'll change the way you behave. But you got to start with the mindset. So we trained all of our folks to have our guests ask this one question. First, we welcome them. Thank you for coming. Have you taken the church tour? And in the church tour, it's not just set up where they can kind of walk through and read little stuff. We do presentations every hour on the half hour. I usually do uh, four or five main presentations, and then we have other people trained to do other presentations throughout the for, throughout the three day festival. And every time we do the festival tours, we always tell them, folks, if you're a Christian, this is part of your heritage. You may not know it's part of your heritage, but for every Christian in the country, every Christian in the world. Orthodox Christianity is part of your, your heritage. It really is. Because it used to be Orthodox Christianity, all there was. There was no such thing as all these different denominations. And somebody asked me, they said, Father, um, uh, do you think the Baptists are going to heaven? And I always tell them, guys, I'm in sales, not management. I don't, I don't get those memos. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, The fact of the matter is, you can't swing a dead cat without hitting 10 Protestants in the head. <laughs> in the area where I'm at, I think Roman Catholicism is probably, uh, probably a huge here as well. But behind all of those different divisions is first and foremost the Orthodox Church. So this is their heritage. And so we make a presentation. It's about 35 to 45 minutes long. And then we leave uh, opportunities for questions. We have displays out there and shows the different things. And then I say to them, I cannot tell you how grateful I am that you've come to our church tour. We'd like to send you a small gift in way, by way of thanking you for attending. Outside on the table are cards that says, 
Thank you for attending our church tour. Please pick one up and fill it out. Oh, and by the way, there's a little box on that says, I'd like to learn more about Orthodox Christianity. Happenstance is the week after the festival, we start a journey to fullness class. Remember, if you're going to change the mindset, you're going to have to reorient the way you do things. So we do twice a year our Journey to Fullness. Journey to Fullness is a um, video series that I started several years ago as an intro to orthodoxy class. We wanted to, um, we wanted to expand the number of people who could take the intro to orthodoxy class because we had so many people who were seeking the faith. And frankly, I wanted to take a break now and again. So we created this 16-week video program the videos are about 20 minutes long. Several of you, several of you may, may use, I know Father John, you use it in your community. Uh, and some of, the, some of the others may have used it in your community. But it's a 16 week course. And in our parish, it's a requirement before you can be made a catechumen. You have to take the course before you can become a catechumen. And the catechumen, it lasts anywhere between a year and a half to two years in our parish. It takes about two years to convert to orthodoxy in our community. And the reason why is folks, there's a lot to unpack and a lot to inform. And frankly, dear ones, aren't y'all tired of giving away your kids and your grandkids because they don't know the treasure they have, isn't it? Aren't you, aren't you exhausted with that? The fact of the matter is the Orthodox faith is the greatest treasure given to human beings. It is God's love letter to the world. If that's true, it's not moral to leave that gift unopened. And so we share the faith with the people who come to the festival. After the festival, we do our journey to fullness class. And on average, between 85 to 90% of the people who take the class become Orthodox. And we have a retention rate of our converts at about 98%. And the reason why is because it isn't just come and enjoy our baklava and our, our, and our spanikopita and our souvlaki, though, I love souvlaki. It's about training a human being to become by grace what Christ is by nature because your parish is the pillar and ground of truth in the community that you're in. That's the insistence of the word of God, the Holy Scriptures. That's who you are. So we begin... By changing the purpose of the festival. Now, that doesn't mean we don't raise money. We do, but we give it away. We're in the midst of a building program right now. Um, by the way, if any of you have a couple of million dollars that's just laying around, please come see me. I've got uh, I've got a project for you. We're in the midst of uh, we have to we have to build. We have a we have a uh, a, a church building right now that it was a, it's a it's a remodeled house, and we can seat about 170 to 180 people. The problem is we have 100 kids in Sunday school. And our average age is about 36 as far as the parishioners go. So like I say, we're bucking the curve. But the reality is, is that we, we have between 155 and 160 families uh, in the community now. When I got there, we had 32 people. And, uh, and it, thanks be to God. This is all because of the grace of God, folks. Listen, when you've got this kind of product to give away, it sells itself, folks, if you'll just do it right. What did St. John say? St. John said the natural consequence of Christians being light in their community are a people are helped to see the light. That's the natural consequence. But before you're ever going to get to the natural consequence, folks, you have to be converted to this reality you have to change the mindset of the community from an inward focus to an outward focus second thing we did we assumed that every person that came to our parish wanted to be orthodox that's an assumption that we make every person that comes to our parish whether it's funeral wedding doesn't matter what it is there's always stuff out there that says would you like to learn more about the Orthodox faith? It's always there. We don't push it. We're not out there banging on doors and doing all that kind of stuff. But it's available to people because of the change of mindset that has to happen. 
The community is designed in such a way that we assume that if people want to learn more about orthodoxy, they can at our place. So instead of having Mr. Grumble at the candle stand on Sunday morning, why not have somebody that's actually happy to be there? And the first face they see isn't, who are you? What are you doing here? <laughs> so, no kid, all kidding aside, when I first converted, I had this precious um, Greek Orthodox lady in the parish that I was in. And she, uh, we, we were wearing name tags. And, and we were in coffee hour and I had a name tag. It said, Barnabas Powell. She walked up to me and she said, looked at it. Powell. Powell. He's not a Greek name. I said, no, ma'am. My, my family is Welsh and Irish background. <laughs> what are you doing here? <laughs> Don't you have your own church to go to? And then I fried. I blew her mind. I said, dear, this is my church. What? <laughs> Why? By the way, Yaya wasn't upset I was there. She was thrilled I was there. She thought it was the coolest thing in the world. I was like, you know, you know, finding a uh, finding a four-leaf clover. It's just amazing. Look at this. <laughs> but she told me later on, she said, you know, Father, I'm Greek. I have to be here. I have no choice. I have no, I can't go anywhere else. I have to be here. But why are you here? Why did you choose to be Orthodox? And it was such a joy to watch the light come on in this precious lady's eyes as I explained to her the absolute indescribable joy of discovering the treasure of Orthodox Christianity. And how this has become the very center of how I understand what it means to be a human being. And why humans were created in the first place. She was thrilled. Because she knew it inside innately, she, but she didn't have any language to describe it. So we assume that every person that comes to our parish wants to be Orthodox. And we design our place so that when the guest comes in, they're handed a welcome packet, and the person that is the greeter offers to sit with them during the service. Because we're an outward-focused parish, not an inward-focused parish. They're not disrupting our regular experience. They're the reason we're here. To share, and by the way, gang, here's something I want you to make, it, make, make a note in your brain. Orthodox Christianity is the only treasure that you can hold on to it if you give it away. It's the only treasure in the universe that the only way to keep it is to give it away. If you don't give it away, trust me, your kids and your grandkids will no longer be connected to the Orthodox Church. You know how I know that? Because it's already happened. What happens to a community when they change their mindset to be an outward focused community instead of an inward focused community is watch how those lifelong Orthodox get energized to be actively engaged in the experience and the living of the Orthodox faith. I do a daily devotional. By the way, if you want to learn more about uh, what we're doing, go to faithencourage.org. That's our website, and you can get you can sign up for the daily devotional. I do a daily devotional Monday through Friday that takes the scripture lesson that we get from the archdiocese, and we just have a, about eight nine hundred words every morning to open that up because we always say that our goal is to be orthodox on purpose, not simply by accident. We want to be orthodox on purpose, so we want to actively engage the practice of the faith. Now, the, before that can happen in your community. You have to change the mindset. Another thing we did is we set aside four parking places in the parking lot that says guest parking. And the parish council looked at me like I was crazy. What do you, what do you mean? We don't have enough room now. Yeah, yeah, but this is about changing your mindset. I know we don't have enough parking places. But our parish exists to be outward focused. So we're going to have four parking places for guests. Because I want to communicate to you and communicate to them. You're welcome here. And your job as being in this parish is to make sure they're welcome. The next thing we did is we assumed that there would be people in our service that didn't know where the bathroom was. So we have signs in our community showing guests where the bathroom is. 
I, I, I want you to do a, I want you to do a, a, a test mm -hmm. in your community. The next Sunday or next two Sundays, look at the crowd and try to determine if there are people in the crowd that don't know where the bathroom is. If you have the majority of the people know where the bathroom is, that's a symptom you should probably look into. We're an outward focused parish. We're not an inward focused parish. And when we are an outward focused parish, the people who are already there have their mindset changed. If you're going to be an outward focused parish, if you're going to be a good steward of the fact that your parish is the pillar and ground of truth in your community, you're going to have to change the mindset. The next thing we did was we used our empty Sunday school rooms to house homeless families. There's a ministry uh, in uh, Forsyth County. Forsyth County is the wealthiest county in Georgia. Uh, it is the 14th wealthiest county in the United States. And it is the fastest growing county. It's also the number one school system in the state of Georgia, Forsyth County, Georgia. Lots of people want to live there. Because of that, we have people who are homeless. In fact, the school system has told us that there are over 600 homeless children in Forsyth County right now, the richest county in Georgia. 600 kids are homeless, which means they're either sleeping on the couch of a relative or they're sleeping in their car. Family Promise takes these families and houses them in churches for 90 days. Different churches, they only stay a week at a time. Different churches, we all partner together. And we house our, we house these families in our Sunday school, our empty Sunday school. How many of you have empty rooms during the week in your church? You have empty rooms during the week in your church? Will you please explain to me the morality of having a child sleep in the back seat of a car while you have an empty room? Can you help me with that, please? Oh, but Father, what about the insurance? <laughs> Yeah, small God. You got a you got a small God, guys. You got to got to get a bigger God. Your God's too small. So what we do is once a week, or excuse me, once once a quarter uh, for a week, these families stay in our Sunday school because it's not moral to have a child sleep in a car if I have an empty room. We're the we're the pillar and ground of truth, folks. We're the Church of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the savior of the world. He loves everybody. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. That's, folks, if you're not governed by truth, what are you governed by? If truth isn't shaping your mindset, what is shaping your mindset? Inward focus, self-centeredness, fear, prejudice. What's shaping your mindset? What is setting the priorities of your community? So we started doing that. We feed them in the evenings and the kids come over in the evenings after they've gone to their, their center where they the parents get training for, for jobs and the kids go off to school. And in the evenings, the kids, our kids come over and we play, they all play in the playground with the, with the kids of the homeless families that are there. Let me ask you a question, those homeless families when they see the people acting this way, what do they think about Orthodox Christianity? These people are saving my life. They're saving my life, the life of my children. We're the pillar and ground of truth, folks. What else are you going to do? So we started that program in our community. Folks, you're already doing something similar in your community. How many of you are involved in food kitchens and you're, and it's especially Philopticos? Philopticos is already doing a lot of this stuff. Start pointing it out and saying we're doing that. The reason why we're doing this is not so that so that uh, we can we can make ourselves our consciences feel better. No, we're doing it because we're the pillar and ground of truth. Change the mindset of your community. The reason why we're doing this is because we're the church. The reason why we're doing this is because we follow Jesus Christ. The reason why we're doing this is because we are committed to helping men and women become by grace what Christ is by nature. And that includes the folks in our community that desperately need to be challenged in their self-centeredness and in their false materialistic ideologies. Our society is being pulled apart by tribalism and by picking sides. 
and saying uh, these new tribes that we're creating out of thin air. This is and, and the victimology that is existing in the society. The church is the antidote to this division and dis and dis and destruction and envy and revenge. The church is the medicine of immortality, according to Saint Ignatius. The Eucharist is the medicine of immortality. If that's true, folks, it's not moral to withhold an opportunity for men and women to become by grace in Orthodox Christianity what Christ is by nature so that they can eventually take the Eucharist with you. That's your job. We tell our folks, and by the way, this is a canon. And I know there are, we got a lot of young kids. You want to talk about a noisy church. By the way, folks, if you don't hear crying in your parish, your church is dying. So Sunday mornings is a zoo in our place. I'm just confessing it really is. It's a zoo. Noisy kids and so on. We had one kid yes, uh, uh, last Sunday. He wanted to come and stand with me on the solea during the home. He just he just been baptized and he was just he was thrilled to death and he recognized me. This guy tried to drown me this in a few weeks. Ago. My parents sit around taking pictures while this guy tries to drown me. He wanted to stand with Father Barnabas on the solea. The parents were just oh, calm down. Let the kid stand with me. I'll hold his hand. We stood there and I gave the homily and everything's fine. We're an outward-focused parish, folks. We're not an inward-focused parish. I had a lady years ago came up to me and she said, Father, I didn't really enjoy the liturgy this morning. And I said, darling, well, that's fine. No problem. We didn't do it for you. <laughs> We're an outward-focused parish. We're not an inward-focused parish. I really didn't get much out of the liturgy today. Well, okay, who cares? <laughs> That's your problem, not mine. We did the liturgy. The body and blood of Christ was given to the faithful. Glory to God. Eternity came in and busted into, into the temporary. And now guess what? Look at that. Turns out you really are what you eat. The body of Christ gathered as the body of Christ to consecrate the body of Christ so that they could consume the body of Christ so that they would be the body of Christ. We're an outward-focused parish, not an inward-focused parish. It's all these kids, wonderful things, wonderful things going on, all of this thing that, that is happening in our parish. It happened because we decided to change our mindset. It starts, fathers, with all due respect, with a pulpit. You've got to start asking your people to change the way they think. Somebody give me the, the uh, definition of the Greek word matanya. TC meaning matanya. Sing me. Change direction. Matanya, we translate it in English as repentance. St. Isaac of Syria said, this life has been given to you for Matanya. Do not waste it on vain pursuits. That's normal. Normal orthodoxy is a life of repentance. If you're not experiencing repentance, you're not experiencing orthodoxy. You're just Greek or Serbian or Russian or whatever. That's all you are. And that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. I'm proud to be Southern. I genuinely, folks, I'm not teasing about this, though you'll, you will laugh, and it's okay to laugh, it's fine, but I genuinely believe this. I genuinely feel bad for people who aren't Southern. <laughs> it is it is one of the most crushing thoughts in my mind that somebody would spend their entire life have, not being a Southern. Why do you think I ended up in the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese? We're simpatico, man. We get, we're getting there. <laughs> But I, I'm not teasing. I really feel that way. Being Southern is the best thing in the world. It's almost as good as being Greek. <laughs> but the reality is, I am an Orthodox Christian first. My ethnicity must serve my Orthodoxy. Orthodoxy must never be the servant of the ethnicity. Because when it does... You become exclusive and inward focused rather than outward focused. And the reason why I know that, folks, is because our churches are getting older and emptier. You have to change the mindset. And fathers, that starts with you. What is the old Greek saying? 
The fish rots from the head down. It starts with you, fathers. You have to preach in such a way that you ask your people to enter into a life of matanya. They have to be told, repent. And to all my lay people out here today, look at me in the face. You need to repent. I'm not playing with you. I'm not teasing you. And I'm not giving you an option. You need to repent. When's the last time you went to confession? Normal orthodoxy has confession. When's the last time? You should have seen the eyes of my parish council when I walked in one day and I said, okay, folks, you got two weeks to tell me who your confessor is and when's the last time you went to confession or don't approach the chalice. I did this with the parish council, not the regular folks. And the parish council's eyes got that big around. So, oh, what? Yeah, 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 get on that. The guy afterwards pulled me off the side and said, Father, are you serious? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> normal Orthodox Christians go to confession. That's normal. And if you don't change the mindset, if you don't reorient your normal towards a fuller understanding of the Orthodox Christian faith, you're mm -hmm. never going to have a large enough soul to turn outward to your community and say, y'all, come on. The purpose of the spiritual disciplines is to form the kingdom of God inside of you so that the whole world can fit in it. And face it, folks, brothers and sisters, fathers, and all of the others, we all need to practice that. So I go to confession on a regular basis. And my spiritual father lectures me. When are you going to stop being such a lousy sinner? Oh, no, he doesn't do that. That's, that's not true. That's normal. If you're going to change your community from an out from an inward focus to an outward focus community, you have to practice the Orthodox faith. It's got to be more than just lip service, and it's got to be more than just a cultural decoration. Every March 25th, I yell Zito Elas, and then I do the divine liturgy for the, uh, the Annunciation. We practice the Orthodox faith. Now, I've gone too long this was 1125. I'm going to leave some time for questions. Is that cool? Yeah. Is that all right? So, not only are we going to change the mindset, and we've already been talking about this, we're going to redefine normal. We're going to redefine normal. Fathers, this starts with you. We're going to redefine normal. We're going to insist, for instance, it's amazing to me, um, we do the homily in our parish right after the gospel lesson because Father Nick Trantafilu threatened me within an inch of my life if I didn't put it there because that's normal. It's normal for the homily because the homily is part of, of the preparation of the people to be ready to receive the body and blood of Christ. And one of the ways that the church has for centuries formed their people to be ready to receive the Eucharist is through the explanation and declaration of the gospel on Sunday morning. That's normal. Now, I know that many times we've moved it to the end of the divine liturgy, but do you know the reason why? To accommodate the fact that folks show up at the Theophone. Folks, that's not normal. It may be common, but it's not normal orthodox. It's, yeah, I, I love you very much. And the neat thing about it is I'm going to get on a plane and all you people have to deal with the fallout of all the stuff I do. It's wonderful. I love doing this. <laughs> Walk into a community, drop a huge stink bomb and leave. It's great. Normal Orthodox Christianity declares the homily after the gospel lesson. That's normal. Because the purpose of the homily is to prepare the men and women to receive the Eucharist. And the receiving of the Eucharist is why we're there. Because the Orthodox faith teaches that we are called to become by grace what Christ is by nature. And the Eucharist is the ingestation of the grace of God through the mystery of the body and blood of Christ so that we can become like Jesus Christ. 
It's not the magic cookie and it's not magic food. It is the divine mystery of the Eucharistic life that resets the normal of my life and reorients my priorities. We were talking um, earlier, and I won't rat at it, I won't rat out anybody, but uh, they know who they are. <clears throat> we were talking earlier about the reality of the, uh, the 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 situation, the demographic situation in our Greek Orthodox Archdiocese concerning our priests. Our priests are getting older. And many, many priests are at that spot of retiring or even past retiring, and they can't retire because there's nobody to take their place. That's that's happening, folks, whether you realize it or not. And I know that we, I mean, listen, my folks think that, uh, that uh, you know, Father Barnabas has been there for almost 14 years. He'll be there forever. He won't be there forever. Trust me. I'm 60 years old, and, um, you know, I want to have a little time to go fishing. When I can. And so I 10, 15 years, God willing. And there's going to have to be a change of leadership. Resetting normal is the preparation of the people of God to perpetuate the faith through the generations and not to say, once I'm dead, I don't care. Everything we're doing right now at Saints Raphael, Nicholas, and Irene, especially with the building, we know that most of us will never see the end results of what's going to happen. We know that. But we're an outward-focused parish, not an inward-focused parish. So it's okay to invest in people that I will never see because in eternity, there are going to be people who walk up to me and shake my hand and shake my people's hands and say, because of your work, we're here. I never met you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were dead 20 years by the time I got around to it. But the ripple effect of a resetting of normal continues this faith into the next generation because of the bravery and the courage and the humility of men and women like you who decide to reset normal to something greater than themselves. Does that make sense? That, it, it, listen, to guys, I'm, I'm telling you, this will revitalize your parish when you have this resetting of the normal. When you decide that the whole purpose, for instance, Great Lent's coming up. And our folks really take Great Lent very seriously. Although I don't let them say, yo, Father, I was reading the package on the back of the day. No, 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 none of that. The purpose of Great Lent is to say no to temporarily, uh, to, to say no temporarily to good things so that I can know how to receive them as gifts later on. I teach my people that. I teach my people that the purpose of fasting is, and by the way, can I give you this, this real quick? Three giants constantly face our lives. Ignorance, forgetfulness, and laziness. Those three giants, those three spiritual giants are constantly dogging our lives. And the church has medicine for every one of them. Ignorance, prayer. The purpose of prayer is to create intimacy between you and God. Ignorance is not about a lack of education. It's a lack of intimacy. You remember the song in the 50s, don't you? To know, know, know him is to love, love, love him. And I do, and I do, and I do. Good job, guys. <laughs> Ignorance is overcome by prayer. The reason why the Orthodox Church creates a rhythm of prayer in normal Orthodox Christian lives is to destroy the power of ignorance to keep you from being close to God. What you don't know can hurt you. And what your people don't know about the Orthodox faith, they are passing on a weakened form of the faith because it's not filled with intimacy and it's not filled with the beautiful wisdom of our Orthodox treasure. Kids nowadays think that Orthodoxy is just that old-fashioned thing that Yaya and Papu do. It doesn't have any relevance for my everyday life. And I want you to know, folks, that's a lie. It's not true. Orthodox Christianity is the absolute way for a human to live his or her life in such a way that they become like Christ. That's the truth. And prayer overcomes ignorance. Forgetfulness is overcome by fasting. 
Nothing helps me remember why I'm in great length and passing the Burger King with the double beef Whopper with cheese and bacon on sale, two for a dollar. <laughs> sure, do that during great length. Thank you very much. Fasting is not the deprivation of particular foods to make you unhappy. God is not the God is not the cosmic killjoy. <laughs> God isn't up there in heaven wondering, I wonder if someone on the planet is having a good time. That's the lie of the evil one that the evil one is telling your kids. The evil one is telling your kids this stuff is all about rules and regulations and it's all about, oh, it's so boring and oh, blah, 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 blah. That's a con, folks. Have the gifts of the spiritual disciplines operating in your lives and your kids will see the glow. And they'll want to stay connected because it's worth it. So fasting overcomes forgetfulness and laziness. Watch this, guys. This is on. This should be on every one of your stewardship committee's spines. Laziness is overcome by generosity. I ride like a serial killer. God help us. <clears throat> Laziness is overcome by generosity. I have never met a generous person that's lazy. Never. A generous person, a person who has generosity in their heart and it has, actually has an outward focus view of their life, they're constantly busy. You've got people in, the, in your parish like that. They're constantly generous with their time and their giving and watch them. They're, they're, they're enjoying their lives because generous people are happy people. Because at the very heart, by the way, do you know what the word Eucharist means? What does it come from? It comes from the Greek word, ephharisto. Tisi mini ephharisto. Thank you. Normal Orthodox Christianity develops an attitude of gratitude and thankfulness. An unthankful man can never be holy. A generous man always is. By the, word, by the way, do you know what the word holy means? The word holy comes, means set apart for a specific use. That's what holy means, set apart for a specific use. What makes the holy people holy is because they have a singular mind on serving Jesus Christ. That's their singular focus. Generosity means a person who understands that the temporary can never be more important than the eternal. And I've never seen a U-Haul at truck following a hearse. Never have. Every one of us are going to face mortality. And you're going to accumulate money. And you're going to accumulate possessions. And you're going to leave it all behind. I love what an old evangelical Protestant missionary said one time, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Generosity destroys laziness. If you develop a generous per person in your own heart, you won't be lazy when it comes to saying your prayers, setting up your icon corner, making sure your kids see you walk by your icon corner and make your stuff roll. That's normal Orthodox Christianity. We have to reset normal in our parishes. That's normal Christianity. If you're not practicing normal Christianity, folks, the question is, and, and, and may I be blunt? I know that's going to be shock to you. <laughs> The reason why many of us are still struggling with temptations and sins that we've been struggling with over and over and over again is because we've lazily refused to practice the faith. The purpose of the faith is to create nipsis, tisimini nipsis, an even keel. Life doesn't carry me too high. Life doesn't carry me too low. I am not conned into believing a delusion by elation or despondency. Both of those places lead to delusion and a false idea. Normal Orthodox Christianity creates nipsis, and it creates an interior peace that is not disturbed by exterior circumstances. Does that make sense? 
Have you ever seen people like that? No matter what they're going through, they're just at rest and at peace in their life. I look at those people and think, oh, tell me how. And the reason why is not very sexy. It's not very exciting. It's just I practice the faith. I practice a normal Orthodox Christianity. So we redefine normal. We stop settling. Watch this. We stop settling for an idea of normal that is decidedly destructive and builds into our communities a guaranteed death. What is normal in your parish now must change. Now, but Father, you, but what if what if people disagree with us? <laughs> Welcome to the human race, honey. There are folks that uh, that vote ways differently than I would vote. It happens all over the day, all over the place. Make your case. Better yet, let a true normal Christianity change your life. <clears throat> what did St. John say earlier when we said that? The natural consequence of practicing this faith is the unchangeable reality that I can't hide my light. It's not that I'm trying to hide my light or trying to shine my light. I've never seen an apple tree out there in the field going, oh, i got to really push these apples out. No, apples are natural to apple trees. That's what apple trees grow. Outward focus is a natural result of practicing the orthodox faith because you're the pillar and ground of truth. That's natural. You don't even have to try to do it. It happens. So resetting the normal in your parish is absolutely necessary. Fine. We're going to build sustainable change through identity. We're going to build sustainable change through identity. What does that mean? It simply means this. I'm going to start identifying first and foremost as, the, as, a, as an Orthodox Christian. Everything else is subservient to that reality. There's a great book that I recommend to all of you uh, that's called um, Start With Why. It's written by a man by the name of Simon Sinek. It's a business book. It's not, it's not a religious book. But I buy it for my parish council every year. And the reason why that's true is because, brothers and sisters, you will never get beyond how you know yourself. How you know yourself determines how you act. And if you think of yourself in certain ways, we've known this psychologically for years. So Simon Sinek wrote this book, Start With Why. And he said that people, people are interested in why you do something, not what you do. They start with why. Why are you doing this? Why are you an Orthodox Christian? Let me ask you this, folks. How many of you were, were raised in the Orthodox Church your whole life? Raised in the Orthodox Church your whole life? Look at that. I want you to know I'm so jealous of you people. I can't stand it. <laughs> I'd given my left big toe to have had this my whole life. If you hadn't been born in an Orthodox home, would you have converted to, to the Orthodox faith? Do you know enough about the faith to say, would you have converted to the faith if you hadn't been born in an Orthodox home? Now, don't get me wrong, folks. I'm jealous that you got the head start, but I mean, goodness, if you ain't going to do nothing with it, I'll take it. Centuries are filled with God calling people to do things and them failing and him giving the treasure to somebody else. Why do you think this madman, southern, old-time Pentecostal preacher is standing up here, here dressed like this? And it ain't like you folks came to get me. We had to hunt y'all down, for God's sake. We're going to build sustainable change through identity. We're going to do what's necessary to become what we say we are the pillar and ground of truth in our local communities. And the people in our communities are going to know that about us. 
It's not going to be the best kept secret in America anymore. In fact, ladies and gentlemen, if uh, your community doesn't know what the Greek Orthodox Church is, one guy, one guy early on years ago said, do y'all pray to Zeus? <laughs> Are you a Muslim? Yeah, Muslims wear crosses all the time. <laughs> if people don't know who you are, it's because you haven't told them. If you haven't told them, it's because of a, of a, of a breakdown in how you know yourself. <laughs> Everybody within a 20-mile radius, in fact, that's what we did. Here's a, here's, a, here's a tool that I can give you to build sustainable change through identity. We put a pin where our parish was, and we uh, uh, demographics say that the average American will drive 20 minutes to church. That's, that's just an average, uh, 20 minutes to church. So what we did, we put a pin in where, where our church was and measured out what would be a 20-minute drive, and we drew a circle around that place, and we said, that's our Jerusalem. That's our home base. When Jesus rose from the dead and the disciples were waiting him to ascend into heaven, uh, they asked him and said, are you going to are you going to are you going to uh, uh, establish the kingdom now, Lord? You're risen from the dead. Are you going to establish the kingdom now? And Jesus says, guys, you're missing a point. We're doing something else here. He said, you're going to receive power after that the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Watch this. And you will be witnesses to me. What's the Greek word for that? Martyria, martyrdom. You're going to be a witness to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. So the four areas of influence that the pillar and ground of truth has in that local parish planted where it is, is first to your Jerusalem. The people in that 20-minute radius are your main target find them get to know them tell them you love them and tell them to become orthodox tell them if they can't do it today do it tomorrow if they can't do it tomorrow then start next week and then create a place inside your parish where they would be welcomed and encouraged to continue their spiritual journey to become orthodox that's your jerusalem judea is the uh, the wider area out there you're you're we, we, we call ourselves, we are an intentional Orthodox Christian community for uh, for uh, North, for Forsyth County and Northeast Georgia. Northeast Georgia is our Judea. Samaria, well, you know what the Samaritans were, don't you? They were half-breeds. They were half, they were sin. <laughs> I had one lifelong guy in a heavy uh, Greek accent saw me last week at the Hellenic Dance Festival. He said, oh, there is the foreigner. I said, Cleroy, the only foreigner here is you. <laughs> My mama talks like this. <laughs> I don't know where you're from, Cleroy. The Samaritans are the ones who are so foreign to you that you can't imagine being their friends. That's also your goal. And then the uttermost parts of the world. An old preacher friend of mine told me one time, he said, son, the light that shines the furthest away is the one that shines brightest at home. I'm going to build sustainable change. This isn't a one and out thing. In fact, brothers and sisters, this change in our community took almost eight years to begin changing the entire mindset. But... What's the old Chinese saying? The best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is right now. So you should have started this 20 years ago. Don't let that kill you. Start today. We're going to build sustainable change through identity. We're going to change our mindset. We're going to reset our idea of normal. And we're going to allow that work to change how I know myself so that I can change how I behave in the world. These three projects that you must begin in your home parishes today will be 
the litmus test that will be used on the last day to find out if you were faithful to the treasure that was dropped in your lap by the grace of God. You know the story in the gospel about the talents. What happened to the guy who hid the talent? I know you were a severe man and you reaped where you didn't sow and you, you gathered where you haven't scattered abroad. So I hid your talent, master. Here it is. We didn't lose anybody, Lord. We maintain the status quo. Here's the talent. Greatest treasure in the history of the universe. And the best you can do is neutral. You're better people than that. You're better Christians than that. And I expect you to change. Or you'll die. By the way, either one works. One gets you excited and moving, and the other one gets you out of the way, and I'll use your resources to plant some good stuff. Either way works. My best friend and I converted to orthodoxy together. And with this, I'm going to close because I want to stop. Rod was my best friend for about 25 years. He and I were both Pentecostal pastors, and we journeyed to orthodoxy together. And when we uh, converted to the faith, uh, Rod took the name Phobius. I was given the name Barnabas by my spiritual father. Uh, and everybody else got to pick. I didn't get to pick. He said, you don't get to pick. You gotta, you're Barnabas. That's who you are. Well, why, why everybody else get to pick? I don't get to pick. He said, you don't get to pick. You're Barnabas. You know what the word Barnabas means, don't you? Barnaba, son, is Hebrew. It means son of encouragement. How'd that do? Yeah? Awesome. Yeah. So Rod took the name Photius. Three months after we converted, we found out that he had a brain tumor. For 18 months, we fought. I was already working for Father Chris Metropolis in uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida with Orthodox Christian Network, traveling around the country speaking. And uh, I got a phone call while I was in someplace up north, I don't remember where, from his wife. His wife said, um, Barnabas, we've been fighting for 18 months. We'd done surgery. We had done chemotherapy. We had done radiation. And they killed the tumor. And then they found another one growing behind. Very common with this kind of cancer. So Darlene told me while I was traveling around, it said, she said, um, um, Barnabas Photius isn't going to go back to the doctor. I said, let me talk to him. And he greeted me on the phone like he had greeted me for consistently for 25 years with the same words he said to me countless times. Hey, buddy, I sure do love you. 25 years hearing that <clears throat> from my best friend. Hey, buddy, I sure do love you. I said, what's up, buddy? He said, I'm tired. And this medicine ain't going to help me. I said, I'm on my way home. I got there on a Monday. He was in a hospital bed in his bedroom. I walked in the door. I walked in the bedroom. He smiled real big and said, hey, buddy, I sure do love you. And I looked at him. I said, uh, Roddy, you're going to have to help me here, baby. I don't know what the planet looks like without you in it. He said, no, this is, this is the greatest thing in the world. I said, honey, you know, you're going to have to explain that because I'm, my world is crawling in around me. He said, yeah, it's wonderful. I get to die in the arms of the church. Isn't that fantastic? So we sang the Psalms. He went into a coma on Wednesday and he was dead on Friday. My angels, looking at your faces, I look at the incredible beings created in the image of God, gifted with the greatest treasure that any human has ever received in the precious Orthodox faith. You will do nothing important in your life, more important in your life, 
and passing on a robust faith to the next generation. And it's time you got on with it. It's time you stop the excuses. Say, hey, well, Father, we're poor people, or we're Greek people, or we're Russian people, or we're Serbian people, or we're lazy people, or that's just not the way we think. Change the way you think. This treasure is too beautiful, and every person gets to die, gets deserves the chance to die in the arms of the church. Every person, especially every person you love, they deserve it. It's what you were called for. Change your mindset. Reset your normal. Build sustainable change in your community through a renewed identity. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so, uh, have some, we have some time. I'm going to take some questions. So if you have some questions or comments, yes, ma'am. It's exhausting, isn't it? I apologize. It's like a garden. It's like a hose. Fire hose. Yeah. Right. How do we start like? Yeah, sure. Fair. Amen. Amen. Sure. Amen. Uh, it's a fair point. Oh, so the first question is, what do we do when we go back to our parishes and we run into people, sincere people, good people, but they don't know their faith and, and this is going to be a real challenge challenge for them. Uh, and the second one is, how, what do we say to people who've left the church? They're not getting fed there. And what do we say to get them to, to possibly come back? So I want to do, do a couple of things. First off, don't ever worry about something that's guaranteed to happen. So if you think you're going to go back to your parishes and start talking about this and there's not going to be any conflict, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> don't be surprised. The enemy will be happy to drive you to divine liturgy on Sunday morning and wait for you to come back and uh, drive you home if you promise to keep your mouth shut. So don't, if you're worried, well, Father, what if this creates conflict? <laughs> it's going to. It didn't mean, but the thing about it is, folks, conflict isn't bad. It's how we handle conflict that's good or bad. In fact, conflict is necessary for deeper communion. Ask any husband and wife that have gone through the hard work of staying together. It's been the times when they've struggled that they've learned about each other better. So don't hide from conflict. Handle it well. If you handle conflict well, you'll create deeper communion. So don't be surprised if they react different. They, they say, well, I don't know. This doesn't sound anything like anything. It's not like what y'all talked about. Okay, fair. Let it change your life and let the light from your change and your practice of being outward focused, let that make the case for you. You don't have to browbeat anybody. You don't have to say, oh, you ignorant people. That's my job. Because I, I confess to you, it's fun for me. I like it. It's fun. It's, I enjoy it. No. But no, seriously. Just let it, let what you've heard affect you. And just like St. John said earlier on, when he talks about, you know, there's nothing colder than a Christian that doesn't care about the salvation of others. And he goes on to say, the natural consequence of loving others and wanting their salvation will show up in your life. So let that be the work. Start being proactive. And secondly, and this is hard, folks, but there may be a place in your own parish where you've got to stop watering a dead plant. It's okay to believe people, hey, we're not interested in this. One of the things that we did in our community is I started believing folks. We're not interested in this at all. Okay. Give me a chance. I can, I, I mean, so we tried, but when they over and over again said, we're not interested. Okay. We went to folks who were. 
So pay attention. And this is one of the beautiful things about Orthodox Christianity. Orthodox Christianity hones your ability to be discerning. Do you understand what I mean when I say discerning? In other words, those Difficult places where you're going to have really, really good people who don't get this or really, really sincere people are saying, you know what? I'm not getting anything out of this place. I'm not coming back. The spirit, the, the Holy Spirit will so hone your life and your attentiveness if you practice the faith that you'll know what to do in those situations. Jesus said to his disciples, he said, listen, they're going to bring you before governors and kings and uh, don't worry about what you're going to say. I'll give you the words to say when you need them. So the most important thing for you to take from this event today is I'm going to let this affect me. I'm not going to assume it's anything of my job to change anybody else. I'll let the Holy Spirit do, do that. And he's a better person to do that than I am. Trust me, everybody I've converted to something has always converted to something else. So I'll let the Holy Spirit do that. Yes, sir. Oh. So, yeah. Right. One is so you're raised by that for eight years. Sure. So confession. why can I confess? Amen. Amen. Fair enough. But great questions, by the way. Now, I would, I would have, as a Protestant, I would have just agreed with you a hundred percent. But I, um, I had to change my mindset. I had to reset my idea of normal, and I had to build sustainable change in my life through a new identity. That's a shameless plug. But uh, uh, the first thing I would say is this. Brothers and sisters, you can't throw rocks at a past you can't change. So don't allow those things to be excuses why you don't move now. Okay? Different historical events call for different times. We are in a culture now that the Christian faith must start shining brightly as an alternative path to human fulfillment. And we have the tools to do that. So practicing the faith, I, and I know, I mean, I was, I've, I've had enough lifelong work that I, mean, I will say this, our parish is 75% convert. So 75% of these people have never gone to another church and they've never known another priest besides me. Boy, pray for those folks. God help them. But the reality is, father's not a title. So when you're in a local parish, that priest takes on the responsibility for your soul. Why do you think the Apostle Paul said, uh, we are of all men most miserable? Because we're the ones that are going to stand before God and give an account for everybody's souls that were under us. So don't throw rocks at what was done. But normal Orthodox Christianity is not a mystery. It's been practiced for 20 centuries. There's only been a few times when the, uh, the, the practice of regular Eucharistic participation was, was unusual. It happened during the 400 years of, of persecution by, uh, by uh, the Ottomans on the Greeks, where the monasteries were the only things that kept things going. That's a lot of that practice flows from that historical experience. But normal Orthodox Christianity is the people of God. In fact, there's a canon in the, the earliest days that says if you miss three Sundays in a row, you've all automatically excommunicated yourself. That's an old canon. And if you don't uh, get to the church in time to hear the gospel, don't approach the chalice. Because that's, that's part of the disciplines to get ready to take the Eucharist. So you have all these things throughout history. 
I'm telling you is this, you don't get extra points for being ignorant. So this is a discoverable phenomena. And there's so much now in English in our culture that we don't have that excuse anymore. We can't do a thing about the way we were raised. And I'm not saying that was even wrong. That may have been the historical need for the situation at the time. Things have now changed to the point we have to reorient ourselves. So that's what I would say about uh, taking the Eucharist. I recommend my people take the Eucharist on a regular basis. And I tell them to take the Eucharist on Sunday morning, you have to have fasted Wednesdays and Fridays. Father, what does it mean to fast, folks? This is not an undiscoverable phenomenon. Ask your priest. Don't eat meat and dairy on Wednesday and Fridays. That's what we do. We take the center of the meal out in fasting so that we remind ourselves what should be the center of our lives. That's normal Orthodox fasting. And I don't fast just because God hates meat and dairy. So I fast on Wednesdays and Fridays. I do not eat on Sunday morning. So if you come to the Eucharist on Sunday morning in my parish and you have scrambled eggs in your teeth, I'm going to hit you with a spoon instead of giving you anything else. Stop it. Go sit down. <laughs> no, that's not true. I won't do that. <laughs> Although the look on their face would be priceless. <laughs> so, and so let me finish one more thing, Father. And so, um, and hear the gospel lesson proclaimed. And have a recent confession. Oh, Father, what's recent? Because you know the Russians practice. You you don't you they they go to confession every time before they they take the Eucharist. And guys, Father's not a title, and you're not idiots. Recent means what recent means. I can't imagine an Orthodox Christian practicing their faith that isn't doing confession at least four times a year. That's phenomenal to me. That a person would skip this spiritual medicine to heal their souls. And just that, that, that confuses me. And that's our, that's our, that's, we priest fault. We should have taught you better. We're sorry. We screwed up. Uh, please forgive us. But I can't imagine a healthy Orthodox Christian not going to confession at least four times a year. Uh, I try to go once a month because I'm a sinner. And as far as, uh, as far as your other question, please remind me again what the second question was. I've forgotten. I'm sorry. Uh, that's a Oh, yeah, instead of confessing. So do that. Do that. Confess to God your sins. Do you? No, 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 no. I'm not going to go. But it also says confess your sins one to another. Do you know that there's not a place in the New Testament that says to confess your sins to God? <laughs> the only place it ever mentions it is when we confess our sins to one another. Because Father's not a title. And my job as the spiritual doctor of, for, for my people is to take medicine off of this treasure house of 20 centuries and say, this may help. But you got to go to the doctor to get better. Now, I'm a man, so I never ask for directions and I don't go to the doctor and I end up paying the price for it. So father's not a title. In the Orthodox Church, we call our priests fathers for a theological reason. And that theological reason is it's my responsibility to take care of you. And to give you spiritual medicine. So if you would go to the doctor for your headache, go to your spiritual doctor for your spiritual illness. That's just normal. It's humble. It speaks to a heart that is gentle and open to the grace of God and correction. And that's what a Christian has to be. So, of course, confess your sins to God. Do that. And make sure you make an appointment for your, with your priest. Or with somebody, for heaven's sake. You don't have to. I mean, I know some people, I, my, some of my parish council, Father, I don't want you to know my sins. I said, well, number one, you got to understand something about me. I don't remember what people tell me. I seriously don't. Because sin is boring, folks. It all runs together. It's the same thing over and over and over again. It's exhausting. Going to going to youth camp and hearing teenage boys tell me they, they struggle with lust. Oh, really? You're kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> what a shock. I'm amazed every day. <laughs> Give me a break, folks. You're just, I mean, y'all aren't that interesting. I'm sorry, you're just not. You're just not that creative. Sin's boring. It's not creative. I mean, it's the same thing over and over again. I struggle with lust. I struggle with greed. I struggle with 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 hatred or anger or vengeance and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Blah blah blah. I don't need to know. God already knows. You need to come clean. I'm only there as a witness anyway. 
And if there's some medicine for you, that's my job. But you're telling this stuff to God. Listen to the prayers that are prayed for you when you're in confession. Brothers, I, brother, I am, I am only here as a witness. You're telling this to Jesus. I'm only here as a witness. That's what I say to my confessees. So listen to the theology of the church, folks. It's all there for you. I mean, it's not like we started yesterday. We're not Baptists. We've been doing this 20 centuries. <laughs> we picked up a few thoughts now and again. Don't go to your grave ignorant. You don't have to. That's what makes this so tragic. Father. Yes, just to give, thank you for <laughs> that transformative message. Uh, but just to give a little witness to what you were saying. Yeah. Last week, went to my niece's wedding in Arkansas. Sort of a family reunion. <clears throat> uh, got to reconnect with my cousin John, whom I loved dearly. Was baptized Orthodox to appease my yaya. Mm -hmm. Was raised in Roman Catholic. Left the Roman Catholic Church. Some evangelical group that he attends. He's engaged to a practicing Hindu. They were at the wedding. Just texted me now during the talk saying, my fiance said something started stirring in her heart at the wedding, going to the Greek Orthodox Church tomorrow. <laughs> so. Folks, first time I went to an Orthodox worship service, I'd never been to a liturgical service in my life. Go to a church in Indianapolis, Indiana. Completely amazing. Stuff all over the walls. Well, I look at first, for heaven's sake. It's like three ring circus in here. <laughs> then this fella came out from behind a wall in the front with a chain with a smoking egg on it or something. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't know. I'd never. I'd, we'd never used incense before. I mean, I'd, I mean, my, my grandmother had potpourri in the bathroom, but that's it. <laughs> <laughs> the guy started shaking it and stuff. And man, I couldn't forget the smell. And it's funny because that's so imprinted on me. By the way, that's why we use the sense of smell in worship, folks. To so imprint on your memory that you can't forget it. I was walking in a mall, passed by this candle shop, and a scent hit my nose and I immediately make this up. <laughs> it's just automatic, muscle memory. That's when you know this stuff's getting inside. Make sense? So this treasure that you've just talked about, this is what this will do, folks. If you do, if you're a, if you're an outward focused parish that automatically is open to other people, they'll sense that, and the treasure that they see in the divine liturgy will draw them to Christ. I'm telling you, folks, your neighbors want to be Orthodox. Your fam, your non-Orthodox family members want to be Orthodox. They want it. They want it more than they want anything else. They just don't know it yet. So you tell them. Any other any other questions or comments, thoughts? Yes, Father. Uh, Oh, that's a good point. Uh, number one, we assume that every chrismated Orthodox Christian has the Holy Spirit. And that the, the scripture that says that you are a member of the royal priesthood is true. So we did, folks, listen, just assume Orthodoxy is right. Just, just assume that. And all the treasures are there. It's uh, Listen, now, now and again, you need an idiot that gesticulates and yells and carries on and acts like an idiot. That's uh, the carnival part. That's fine. Hopefully that's it. And, and thank God most priests aren't like that. Thank you, Jesus, for heaven's sake. It's exhausting. But specifically to your point, one of my primary jobs is helping the people to discover their giftedness and then bless them to get to work. And so that's what we focus on that. See, we're an outward focused parish. So that means that everyone, by the way, do you know the difference between an audience and a congregation? An audience is there to watch something happen. A congregation participates in what's happening. In the Orthodox Church, there's only one member of the audience and he sits on the throne of glory. Everybody else has work to do. 
and you don't get to be lazy, especially in, in our community. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, those people who want to be lazy end up probably they'll go someplace else because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a very rude person and I don't give up. So I would say, Father, one of the things that I would encourage all of the priests to do is ask the Holy Spirit to give you discernment to help your folks discover what their particular giftedness is. And the reward for that, from that mindset, starts producing other leaders. And all, all, we're sending two boys to the two because uh, I tell all my boys that that uh, that work in the altar. Uh, man, if you're going to work in the altar, one of the things that you have to do is consider the priesthood for a vocation. You have no choice. If you serve in this altar, you automatically say, "I will make the priesthood one of the options of me being." In, in my professional life, period, full stop, end of discussion. If you don't want to do that, then that's okay. You don't have to serve in the altar. But some of you are going to be at home here. So my job as the parish priest is to help them to discover that giftedness and then send them off. Because folks, listen, a community that isn't reproducing their own leaders is dying. If you're not reproducing your own leaders, you're dying. So I tell my parish council, you are required when you're on the parish council, you're required to, to, to identify two other people who could take your place and then be, be there and train them. That's your job. Can't come off the parish council until you do that. And that's just, we expect it. Yes, Father. I want to know your parish. Wow. Ah, beautiful. Well, it starts with our, with our, uh, with our vision statement. We are an, an intentional Orthodox Christian community for Forsyth County in Northeast Georgia. So we're an intentional Orthodox Christian community because the why of our parish is because the Orthodox faith makes men and women like God. That's why we practice the faith. The Orthodox faith, what did the, what did the ancient saints, what, what was his name, Ignatius, that said that Christ became in flesh so that we might become in God? Folks, you're going to be with God forever. You're already around him right now. You're just in a place where you don't notice it all the time. You should straighten that up. But you're going to come to a place where you're not going to be able to escape it. And the fire of God's presence is going to be there undiluted for eternity. Some of you are going to call where you are hell. You don't have to do that. Get used to the light now. Stand in the fire now with the three Hebrew children. By the way, go to Orthros. If you go to Orthros... You will get a NIMDiv Orthodox education in a year if you attend Orthros and understand the hymns. If they do it in Greek, get the translation. If you go to Orthros for a year, you'll have an MDiv. Listen, gang, Orthodox Christianity doesn't do anything in the corner. We do Orthodox theology through liturgy. Go to church. A vibrant Orthodox church has three characteristics. You ready? The first characteristic is that a vibrant Orthodox church has lots of services. Lots and lots of services. Every day, all the time. Church services. <clears throat> Sunday only church is a symptom of sickness. The church has nine hours of prayer a day. So when the Muslims tell me they pray five times a day, I think, what are you, girls? What's the deal? <laughs> That's it? Only five? What's wrong? You don't love God? Nine, nine hours of prayer a day. So we got, we got orthodoxy. Okay, see, orthodoxy. Orthodoxy redeems your time. It redeems your calendar. It changes your clock. Orthodoxy, if you believe it, reorients your normal so that you see time differently. Do you understand what I'm saying? So Lots of church services is one of the characteristics of a vibrant Orthodox church. The second is lots of adult education. The best Goya program in any parish is a demanding adult education program. If you think for one second, now listen, I'm good, okay? I am. I'm great at what I do. Even me, as great as I am, can't undo 90% of the, your kid's time spent under the influence of other things. I'm good, but I ain't that good. You're the one who has them all the time. So if you want a strong youth program, have an, a, a demanding, robust adult education program. Tell your parents you don't get the extra points for being ignorant. 
Tell your moms and dads to stop depending. I did a family bring me a teenager going absolutely. She's just absolutely lost. Father, can you fix this? No, I can't. I can pray for you. I can love you. We'll walk together through this, but I can't fix this. So, amen. So stop, stop expecting the church to do what you won't do for yourself. Stop. stop. You're the pillar and ground of truth. You're the royal priesthood. Get off your lazy rear ends and get to work. He says with all the love in his heart. Third thing. Third thing. Thank you. Got to stop eventually. Successful and effective preaching. Those three characteristics are characteristics of vibrant Orthodox churches. I recommend you look up a man by the name of Father, Ar uh, Father um, Evan Artemis in Colorado. Absolutely amazing guy, fantastic. If you want to see some of our homilies every week, you can go to Faith and Courage TV on YouTube and you can watch the homilies every week. One, one brother priest was telling me, he says, Father, I, I can't have my people do that. I, I steal your homilies. No, 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 you don't understand. I stole my homilies. Nobody's ever had an original, well, I did have an original idea once, it was wrong. So, um, so those three characteristics are the characteristics of dynamic Orthodox churches. I'm going to stop, Father, I'm going to let you know. No, no, it's okay. We got, we got uh, 10, 12 minutes till lunch is ready, so. What else? Anything else? Yes, right here, Father. Yes, go ahead. Uh, it's not a question, it's more of a comment. Oh, Lord, uh, I repent. <laughs> just witness to what uh, Father Barnabas was talking about. Uh, changing the reason for a festival. Uh, about five years ago, Father George. Was that a long ago? So oh was it? Gosh. Anyway, he introduced me to Father Barnabas's uh, YouTube video. And he challenged the our parish council to watch these videos. So we watched the video on the festival. The one that I shared with you in the email about the. About yes. This. So, got our group together, uh, festival committee. Okay, what can we do? What can we do to change our focus? So the people came up. We need a greeter. We had people greeting uh, the, uh, our guests. We had people uh, that were cleaning up the tables, handing out flyers. Oh, wonderful. They were out there saying, we have uh, tours. Would you like to go see the tour? Would you like to be? I mean, we had a great increase from one year to the next. I mean, that's incredible. And that, so they, they made all of these changes a month before the festival. Wow. Good. I sent them the video and said, it's too late to do this now, but I want you to watch it now, process it through this festival so we can do it next year. And instead, they all watched the video within a week. They met without me the next week. And by the time the festival came, we had 10 times the number of people come through the church tour. Yep. And the beautiful thing they did, so their parish festivals are Friday, Saturday. And then Sunday, as a reward to the laborers, they cook the leftovers of the food, and oh, wow. that's the meal. And so what, what what could we do? We could say, here's the, you know, we talk about the church, show, you know, shared information, all this, and you're welcome to come join us Amen. on Sunday. You can eat the same food for free because Beautiful. the community is the thing we're selling. And starting a week from starting in a week, we're doing our intro to orthodoxy classes after the liturgy. You're welcome to come worship with us. Amen. And God bless it. We had people coming. We had somebody who converted because of it. We had, you know. Now, I'll tell you what will happen, folks, when you start doing this in your parishes. It's going to cause trouble. If you think for the end, for, for one second that the enemy is going to let you just do this and actually become the pillar and ground of truth in your local community? <laughs> no. You're going to get pushback. Okay, that's fine. Expect it. Don't be shocked by it. Deal with it. And love people. Father, Yo. back to our little story. Please. We did less promotion that year, but still had our best festival ever. Wow. You know, glory to God, I all I can say. God bless. Well, and folks, listen. When you when you line up with what God wants to do with His world, you reap that blessing. It's nice being in, being in line with what God's doing in the universe. That's normal. 
So find out what that is and get in it. All right. I love you. Thank you for your time. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, have, uh, Father, Father Busta will do the uh, prayer for our function. Pray for the Father, the Son, the Spirit, and our Devil. What a mercy, what a mercy, what a mercy she found us. Thanks for the thing. It's a blessed occasion with one another, learn and grow the treasure which you have gifted us. Bless this fellowship, may this work fulfill the teaching of the Holy Will. Bless all those present, the families, our parishes, and the people you are about to see. We look forward to one now. Amen. Amen. We have one hour for lunch. About one thirty, we'll be back. See, thank you. Yeah, uh, so you will know we'll have a print picture or the of the back of the yeah, yeah. 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 yeah.